Today, we have Bill Milstead, Senior Developer, and Troy Ferguson, Senior Product Manager for Lectora. They are going to show you how to build a scrollable course in Lectora. So without further ado, guys, I'll hand it over to you. Awesome. Thanks, Stephanie. Um, hello, everybody. Hello again. Uh, you may remember me from such classics as the accessibility webinar last month. Uh, my name is Troy Ferguson, and uh, I was scrolling through the reason this this session came about uh, this month is I, I was going through the community and, and you know someone made reference like you know I'm trying to build a scrollable course it's a little clunky in lectora can you help us out and so who better do I think of of other options or ways to do this than our our resident in-house expert of lectora Bill Melstead so I've asked him to come here and, and share some uh, some thoughts and ideas he has for this, you know, how to build a scrollable course. So Bill, anything you got for us, take it away, sir. All right. So yeah, um, we're gonna, we're gonna do this pretty kind of informally and, and conversationally as much as we can for the folks that are here. Um, so uh, if you have questions, if you have thoughts, if you want to chime in along the way, and you're, you're hearing the call with us, please do so. Uh, no need to wait to the end. No need to, you know, be formal about it. Let's just make this uh, comfortable and, you know, get you sorted out if you if you have something you want to you want to chat about uh, as it relates to this or or really actually frankly anything Lectora. Um, you know, as long as we don't deviate too too far from from uh, at least the initial stream. Uh, if it if it does deviate super far from this kind of initial topic, let's hit that at the end. But uh, but either way, we're still we're still good to get you sorted out. So uh, yeah, so I'll, I'll, I'm going to show you guys real quickly um, just a few, I guess, things to think about with uh, creating a vertical scrolling course in, in Lectora. Um, I'm going to show you a couple examples that we have out there uh, on the library that you can download and pick apart. Um, and those are going to be useful both just as kind of like a, you know, a refresher for, for what we are going to look at today, you know, and as well as kind of a, you know, a, a good look at what a, a nice example um, of a vertical scrolling course can look like. Um, but they're also, um, the ones that I'm going to show you are really great examples to pick apart to see how we put together some features that are in Lectora desktop that are um, really kind of especially useful for a vertical scrolling course uh, to help you, you get some uh, kind of more of a modern web experience with your, your course authoring. Okay. Uh, so I'm going to show you a couple of course examples. And then uh, I'm also going to create uh, a course, a long scrolling page, just a single page um, from scratch while we're here in the webinar. And I'm going to use our wireframes uh, to do that. Um, so if you're not familiar with what wireframes are, you will be soon enough. Okay. Uh, so let's, let's just bonus get content. Whee! All right. Uh, I'm going to share my screen and we're just going to go ahead and get right into it. So you're probably looking at Lectora right now, I'm hoping. Probably seeing a bunch of courses with missing fonts. Um, that's as to be expected. Uh, so what I did, I got a brand new machine. I got no fonts on it, got nothing going on um, with it, having cleaned it up. But I did download right before we hopped in here, um, just like a brand new user like you might, um, a couple vertical scrolling showcase courses. Um, I left them this way so you can actually see kind of how we've, we, we're doing a few things in case you're super fresh to Lectora that's going to teach you something new. If you're not, you understand that this doesn't, it doesn't really matter all that much. Um, but the first one that I've got up here, I've got this, uh, gardening showcase course. Okay. This is one of the first vertical scrolling showcase pieces, um, that we, we really played very much with here with Lectora desktop. Um, and you notice that kind of font thing that I was making a reference to, right, about being missing. If you're brand new to Lectora by any chance, um, this might, wait, why is it, it looks different here on this screen than it does in the development window. Why is that? That's because we're using custom web fonts. Um, we've got those declared uh, in a meta tag up at the very top of that template. Um, so this course, whenever you're reviewing it, is going to reach out to Google in this case and grab in some fonts and, and kind of re repopulate the course uh, with custom fonts as we intend. So this is another little bonus content, as Troy was saying, uh, for folks who, who may not necessarily be aware of that bit of it. Now, uh, that's particularly, I think, I personally think that's particularly re relevant to doing a vertical scrolling showcase course like this or, or minus the showcase, a vertical scrolling course like this. Um, 
uh, and kind of a way to think about like Tora, right? These are additional fonts as meta tags up at the very top, a global object in our Lectora course that's really similar to the way that meta tags get included in an actual web object. And then we're going to be developing something that's strictly for web in a way that is really much more reminiscent of web development. Think that way while you're doing this is really what I'm trying to get to, and it'll make it easier for you to do. All right, so back to this example, um, we thought like web stuff, right? We were, we were trying to figure out a way to make something uh, that looks different than your average sliding course, average or slide based course rather, uh, and um, realize that, you know, we've got kind of some, some play with the way that uh, page dimensions can be set up in Lectora as compared to other tools. And hey, why can't we do a vertical scrolling? course, right? So, so that's, this is our first example of that. This is the first attempt, attempt at that. Uh, and when we built it out, I really wanted to build something that kind of behaved more like a modern web experience. So you notice as we're moving down the page, we've got content that kind of progressively reveals as we hit the point on the page. Um, but even as we're moving through our interactions, they work as you had expected, but they're just a different spot in the page, right? So um, this one was very simple. Uh, I just really took a couple of interactions that we had from our heirloom course starter that exists uh, in the library and I stacked them together in one page of a, of a Lectora you know project and added some actions and published it we've got that on the library for you to look at again I'll show you how specifically to make it but this is one example of the type of thing you can make uh, and, and I think that's uh, uh, you, you hit on it but a little bit and thinking of it in terms of almost web design and the, as yeah. far as the flow you're looking for, it's not as sh sure you don't see the, it, maybe it's not a, a drag and droppy kind of deal, but you're building a, just such a robust course with just that same feature, yeah. but it's from a web development kind of view. You're teaching your audience a different way. That's exactly right, right? And so, so to that end, right? Um, the next example I'm gonna show you is actually the next kind of big, play thing that I did with a vertical scrolling course. It's this Jupiter, the gas giant page that I've got in the, the, this, this other document. Um, what this is, is this was kind of an experiment for Lectora desktop. We're playing with CSS and doing some kind of funky stuff and pulling in pages from different, you know, areas of the course, figuring out ways we can make things that look like something you wouldn't expect out of Lectora. And, and one specific page in that, I did this Jupiter, the gas giant page. Um, and like Troy was saying, right, um, I'm, uh, I'm delivering content, but on this page, I'm doing it in a completely different way than we did on the last one that I showed you. So rather than uh, kind of a standard, you know, click to reveal stacked on top of a content stacked on top of a click to reveal, um, just chose to use the same types of triggers that we were using in the previous example that you saw to create something that's more of a narrative piece and kind of tells a story with the movement up and down the page. Again, back to thinking about how is this typically done in a more modern web environment versus uh, learning, you know, a kind of a traditional slide-based learning environment. Um, you'd, you'd see an object that maybe moves and transforms down a page and encourages the user to continue on with the story rather than breaking it up into similar sections and having them click to reveal each one, right? That's kind of the type of thing you'd see. So we built that here as kind of a second example of the type of thing that can be done and a different way to think about this. So as I move down the page, you'll see my planet here is also going to move with me. It's getting a little sketchy because I got some bandwidth stuff, but as I move down and see again, we got more content that's adjusting. It's a little off kilter on the page here because the page is, is intended to be larger than my current desktop. But uh, and as I move down, it rescales, kind of moves to another position on the page. Again, reveals some additional content about Jupiter here. And then as I keep moving down on the page, right, it kind of repositions, gives some more content, changes scale again, and we get this animation bit. But then more importantly, as I move back up the page, as long as I don't do it too quick and, and goof things up with my lagging system here, it'll refollow that story and, and retell the story, right? So completely different experience than we otherwise would have had if, if we had done this just as a standard click to reel, right? And effectively the same type of build as, as the last thing that I showed you. Yeah. Well, it, now, it touches on one of the things like I, uh, I'm such a big proponent of our, of scenario VR and VR training in, in different aspects too, because it creates a, 
an emotional response, you know, like a trigger to where you work on muscle memory and stuff. And with this, when I see scrolling through the Jupiter course or even this game, you have such more of a chance to tell that story and connect that way uh, than, you know, like we've said, our traditional, like, hey, just, you know, click on to the next slide kind of deal. So it's, you're, you've, you've captured attention. Uh, well, ex exactly, right? Uh, and and so, so kind of to that end, right? Like, as we're going forward, you know, I'm starting off with all the, hey, here's these examples. Okay, and here's all this cool stuff we've done. Kind of given this narrative about like, here's where we started with this type of thing. Here's a second example. Here's a third example. Here's we're doing all this thing. I'm doing this this way. I'm, I know I'm kind of we're we're working our way through it until I get to the, the yeah. here's how you do it part. Because there's really two elements to building out one of these vertical scrolling courses that you got to be aware of. One of those I can teach you today, and that's the practical aspect of how to do it. But the other part is that I, that I can't really teach you is kind of how to think about it and how to approach it. Um, so I want to show you before we get into the like, here's how to actually do it, right? Like here's how to put together some things and make a page tall, which is kind of what we're talking about. Um, mm -hmm. Before that, we got to reset your brain and think about like, okay, one, we're not thinking about a standard slide based delivery thing here. So um, while I could do that, like I did in the first example, I've got some interactions that are just kind of dropped on a page and I move down. Okay, I got a clip to reveal now and I got some content. Now I got a clip to reveal and now I got a carousel, right? You can certainly do that. This also gives you the ability to kind of move way outside the standard e-learning box and use the same tool in a completely different way, right? But you've got to get that design and thinking aspect of it down uh, and, and re kind of refocus your brain in that, that kind of a path. Um, that's much more important than the, okay, here's how we make a page bigger and how we put content there, right? Which we're going to move into after this piece. So to that end, this is kind of uh, one of the more more recent versions that we've we've done um some of the some of the most recent stuff i, I would like to show you but i don't know if i can honestly because it's a uh, uh stuff that we're, we're still currently working on um for for some other needs but man does it take this to kind of the next level with with from a web perspective right mm -hmm. but but this this one is our next evolution of what we're doing with this kind of a vertical scrolling course is actually a whole game um and not only are we telling a story as we go down the page not only are we including an interaction as we get on on the page, but now we're including forward and backward navigation, like that Jupiter example I showed you, with penalties, with game, you know, gamification yeah. elements of it, with some kind of more enhanced interaction elements to make something that's just significantly different than a standard slide-based, uh, you know, course would be. And certainly, if we're talking about a standard rapid authoring tool, this is different than you can do in any of the other tools that are out there, right? Yeah. Um, so this is an example of that, right? As I move down the page, I've, I've kind of got this story where I've got to, I've got to, you know, uh, find this cat, right? Whatever's going on here. I've got to roll some dice to do it. I click it. I'm going to move my character down the page. Uh, and we're getting along the way as we land on specific cubes or, 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 or board tiles, whatever the right term is. Um, we're going to pop up a, a bit of detail here and show the user um, you know, the, the content that we're, we're looking for. It's basically a click to reveal, but we're not forcing the user to get to it. Uh, and we're allowing it to happen completely at random. And we're adding some incentives along the way for them to do so, because uh, as ha having landed on this particular tile, they actually, they earned a, uh, a little token. Um, and in order to really fully complete this module, they have to earn all of the tokens that are hidden along the way. Uh, and you know, you, you kind of, you got some consequences, to some, some pitfalls to keep you from doing that, but we're also timing how quickly users are doing this kind of movement down the page in this long format, uh, and, and doing stuff with it at the end of it, right? We've got leaderboard values, things like that. So we're kind of creating some, 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 you know, uh, some desire to move through this thing from our users. Right. But ultimately this is kind of built really. Same exact way as the very first thing that I showed you and what I'm about to show you in just a second here, right? It's just a completely different way to look at something. Oh, hopefully you heard that. Oh, All I thought right. that was Stephanie for a second. Sorry. No, that oh. was that was our oh. little hidden, hidden kitty cat. We got oh. some little hidden oh. stuff in this thing. Uh, Stephanie, you can just chime in if you need to. You don't have to. Oh. I just have me. so many thoughts to share about this game and they're all coming out in the form of a meow. I, I, I'd imagine. I can imagine. So, uh, yeah, so, so unless we have any, like, you know, questions that are coming from, I see a bunch of chats popping up. Um, this is the type of thing that we're ultimately going to be working toward. 
I'm going to move on unless we want to stop and ask questions to actually, here's the real practical, very beginning bare bones look at how you get to this type of thing, right? How you start yeah. uh, in Lector. Okay. I'll give you some tips along the way. So, all right. I'll take it as I can move along and we will do so. Okay. So first thing I'm going to do, if I can get some of this Zoom interface out of the way. So I'm going to create a new document in Lectora. Okay. Um, now there's a bunch of ways you could do this, right? Um, you could add a theme, um, you know, start from a theme, which is one of the popular ways to create a, a course in Lectora or project in Lectora. Um, that'll work for what we're doing here. Um, in fact, we've got themes set up so that the you know, nav bar obviously is gonna always stay at the header and the bottom bar that we've got you know, is gonna reposition down to the bottom of the page no matter how big you make it as a footer. Um, so that'll really still work for this type of thing if you've already themed out courses. Um, I'm not gonna do that though. I'm just gonna have a blank project. Uh, I could do that from a blank theme, but I'm just gonna close out the dialogue and start from here. Uh, fun little tip. Um, when I'm doing these courses, I only develop for two at most device views. Um, it's a vertical scrolling course. We don't really need to worry about the landscape views, right? Um, let's let Lectora feed out the desktop views to those particular lower device views. Do away with those. It'll work just fine in desktop mode and vertical scrolling mode. Same thing with the tablet portrait. Um, just, just don't need it. What, what's on desktop is going to work very well, almost 100% of the time in tablet portrait, okay, uh, specifically for this type of thing. Um, I may, depending on my content, depending on what I'm trying to build, leave my mobile portrait enabled and develop to that as well. But again, it depends on my content and it depends to a certain extent on my design, okay? If I turn that off, which I'm most likely to do, that means that I develop for one device view and then I feed the desktop out to all my other devices. Again, for three of the additional four, that should be no concern whatsoever. On the mobile portrait, though, you may want to just be aware of that if you're taking this approach and only developing for desktop when it comes to things like font sizes, object sizes, right? Things like that. Just be aware. Everything's going to shrink down when you get down to that, you know, mobile portrait. So you're going to want to make sure your font size is large enough to accommodate that shrink. If that doesn't work for you, then you need to develop for the mobile portrait as well as a secondary device view. But that's that's largely not, not that much of a headache. Most of the time I don't. Most of the time I develop for, for just the desktop and it, it works just fine. So uh, first thing I do then is turn off all my device views. Done. Uh, the next thing that I do is I go in and, and I generally have an idea of about how big my page is going to be. Okay. Um, because in my content outline for something like this, if I've got, let's say, five slides uh, worth of content that I'm going to translate into a big vertical page as a developer, my IDs come over and said, Hey, I got these five slides. It's, you know, three interactions and two content slides that you need to, you need to turn them into this big vertical scrolling format. Um, I know that, well, okay, each one of those is probably gonna occupy about a standard slide height. So then I basically just need to make this page about five times the standard slide height to accommodate all that content. Unless I'm collapsing it together and making a compound interaction, we can assume that each one's gonna have about the same real estate and it'll be about five times the size that it would be. So whatever 662 times five is, let's just say I would do, right? Go in here and say six, turn on numlock. 662 times five, and so that's 3310. So I'm gonna go over to my desktop here and I'm gonna hit properties. Under inherit uh, page size, I'm going to uncheck that. And for height, I'm going to say 3310. Okay. Now, if you scroll down, you'll notice you got a really long, tall page. Uh, and just for, for, for funsies, I'm going to go ahead and just to, to kind of call back to what I was saying earlier, I'm going to go ahead and add a theme that I know has a, a header on it and a footer. And if you'll notice, I've got a header up here. And if I scroll all the way down, See, I've got a footer aligned to bottom. So if, for instance, you were building something like, I don't know, a website using Lectora and you needed a header and a footer, uh, those themes could really come in handy. So uh, I generally think that, that Lectora, we, we really need to think about it in a different way than just slide-based training. 
um, it's really useful for things like uh, microsites, right, or little intranet hubs, things that you could dump files out on, or even little micro training pieces. Those can all be built in Lectora, and they're basically websites. This is useful for that. Yeah, yeah all we right. just did our whole the uh, our whole uh, rebrand was done, and instructions, everything was done yeah. uh, in Lectora. So yeah. it's it's a that's, practice that's much actually, preach. That's actually the file I was. Uh, was there you go. To. See, yeah, Look I don't know us. if I can show it or not, but yeah, we built the uh, we built a bunch of our internal. We had a brand hub. We built it in Lectora. You know, it's and it's a it's a functioning website, right? But it's built in web. It's built in Lectora. Same thing. Some of the internal training that we're doing is a bunch of vertical scrolling stuff, but it looks like a fully immersive website in a completely different way than than the other training that we've done in the past. And it's just this thing, right? Um, yeah. Themes, though, can make that even easier for you. If you've got one, you got a branded theme, header and footer, pop a theme on it. There you go. That part's done for you, and you can move on through your page. Okay. But in this case, I've got a 3,000 pixel some odd page. I need to go ahead and start dropping my content in it. If I'm doing this completely from scratch, that's easy enough, right? Like the first step for me, the way I personally develop, is I would actually go in here and create up zones, right, where basically... I'm just going to create some little buckets for myself or even drop guides, right? That would be an easier way to do it. But I, I like having physical markers. Um, so I would go in here and I would, you know, do something like create a 1009 by 662 uh, chunk, right? And give it a background color just so I can see where it is. Um, and then, you know, oops. Oops. By zero, right? And then I'm just going to go in and do that a couple times and kind of mark off where my slides would be as kind of landing zones on my page, right? You know, uh, mm -hmm. as kind of a work area, if that makes sense, right? So I'm going to slide right. one here, slide two here. That's starting totally from scratch. That's how I personally like to do it. And that's assuming no assets, no nothing. It's all coming into the tool. But if you're going to start from uh, like a template or something like a wireframe, for instance, which is actually a really great way to start for these types of things, um, that's a slightly different process. And there's a, a few little things we, we need to be aware of. Okay. Um, now, as I'm saying, we need to be aware of them. Uh, I will also say that one thing that we're trying to do in the library right now uh, is, oh, cool, is, man, connection is being really awesome right now. Uh, one of the things that we're trying to do in the library right now is actually we're going to we're going to build out some um, assets that are really specific to uh, developing for a vertical scrolling piece. Right. So that some of the things that I'm about to show you, you got to be aware of. You can just ignore. OK. All right. So getting around that bad gateway there, we're just going to go through here and look for wireframes. Um, I was going to click on it as a, a category on the tools. So I was trying to do when I was backing out. But. It got goofy on me, so no big deal. No problem. Uh, and what I'm going to do here is I'm just going to grab a couple of these wireframes just so we can we can get started somewhere. Okay. Uh, first one, let's just scroll down and grab a little, you know, kind of a click to reveal. Grab this four tab click to reveal AWO here. Now I'm going to use AWOs because it'll keep everything in the same page or in the, rather in the same project rather. Uh, but it will create new pages for each of these AWOs that we've dumped out. There's a bunch of ways. For, you know, for some of us laymen, what does AWO stand for? No problem. So if you go, thank you for, for that. If you go back to this file, um, if, I, if I click on the actual library page, you see we've got two different download files that are available to us. Okay. We've got an AWO. Yep. We've got an AWP. Um, an AWO is a library object. All right, um, so that is just one, it's one storable, reusable object type in Lectora. You can turn anything into a library object in Lectora. You can save a button, you can save a block of text, you can save an entire page like we've got here, okay? Um, and an AWP is an actual template. Um, they go in different places when you download them. They function differently in the tool when you download them. If you download an AWP, it'll leave you in the same project, but it's going to create, it's either going to inject that AWP, I'm sorry, if you download an AWO, it's going to leave you in the same project, but it's going to inject that library object into the project. If it's a page, like in this case, it's going to inject a whole page, but if it's an object, it's just going to inject an object. If it's an AWP that you download, it's going to create a whole new document for you. All right. Start from scratch. So this one that I'm working on is going to go away and then a new one's going to open up and I don't want that. 
I just want to insert this AWO. Okay, perfect. Thank you. So from here, um, I'm actually just going to keep doing that. I'm going to grab a couple of the files I'm going to work with. So we have them all, all at once and then we can kind of move forward from there. I want to grab this carousel thing here. Again, I'm going to grab another AWO. Okay. All right, and then I'm gonna go over here and I'm gonna grab, I don't know, why don't we grab another clicker revealer? So let's grab this guy. I've downloaded all of them before. Let's grab this one today. And an AWO of this eight tab, okay? So now I've got my three interactions that I'm gonna play with in this file. Um, that's all we're gonna really look at today. Um, there's again, a bunch of different ways that you can do this. Um, we give you the AWOs as the actual page for wireframes, but you can most certainly create your own uh, library object out of just the objects inside of that page. Um, we give you the, the page because that's most common to how our users use it. But as we go mm -hmm. forward and we start developing some, some assets that are specific to vertical you know, development, um, we'll probably give these to you ungrouped from the page so that you have them just as the object itself. Um, and that way, when you, you inject them from the library, they'll go directly into your project page instead of creating a new one, right? Um, as demand grows for that, we build more of that out. Uh, so, but right now we don't, we don't have, so I, I could make that. I could go and I could say save library object and then dump that in. Or I could just go over here and, you know, drag everything from my four, page, four tab into page one. Everything slowly disappearing. And if you notice, I no longer have anything in page uh, the four, four tab, so I can just delete that. And if I go up to page one, there we go. Everything's there. Um, now, the next thing you're going to do is basically the exact same thing as that, but you're going to do it with the next page. Okay. So you're going to go to your next page, grab the content of that. And you're going to drag it up. One little thing to be aware of. The reason why I didn't immediately grab everything and drag it forward like you saw me start to do there is because these actions, these can live inside of this content group. So when you do that, it could potentially make Lectora a little unhappy. So if I have any loose object actions like this, or I'm sorry, page actions like this, I just go up and I move those first and I tie those up to my top page, right? Again, this is if I'm working from a, a template or a wire. All right. And then I just grab my stuff on the page and do the same thing I did previously, move it up to the, the one above it. So now I've got two interactions on that page. Okay. It's taking a second. I'm going to delete that carousel page again to keep everything kind of together. But you'll notice that when I go back to my page one, content's overlapping. Because again, we're used to developing in slide-based terms. Um, positioning is relevant. So when we're building out these templates, everything's positioned to the slide, you know, zero to zero. It's positioned based on a slide. It's not relative to where you drag it. It's relevant to zero, zero. So what you got to do there, very simple stuff. You just go grab the content that's your second, you know, chunk of content, uh, highlight everything in the, the file in your Project Explorer and drag it where you want it. Um, once you get it there, let go and give it a preview. Uh, and you're probably pretty good to go. Um, so for instance, if I go over here and check content one, two, three, four, that all works. Move down my page. Okay, carousel works. And then it's gonna be a kind of a, you know, a, a repetition of that for my eight tab interaction that we downloaded as well, right? I'm just gonna go back to that page, grab the content from it. I'm gonna drag it into page one, move it down, Kind of repeat that until I'm done. Cool part about using wireframes is that you know the the design is largely stripped, um, so you can get the interaction and the kind of basic elements chunked out for you, so that you can start custom completely from scratch, but without really having to start custom completely from scratch, uh, yeah. and then go in and just restyle this stuff. And and really, that's truthfully how I I do a lot of these types of things. I'll start from a wireframe, drag everything over reposition and move things. And then I start going in and styling, right? So I'm gonna change my button styles to match whatever my brand theme is, get that kind of laid out nicely. From here, it becomes kind of thinking about the file 
differently, right? Because again, making a long page and dragging over templates and repositioning them is a no brainer. Everybody can do that. It's very easy to do. It's kind of a simple thing. And, um, you know, as long as, uh, you know, as long as the template is happy with, with where you're putting it, then it's not, you know, not a lot you got to think about. Um, but the design end of it again, back to kind of that, the first bit of it becomes important here again. Um, how are you going to segment out your, your chunks of content so that it doesn't end up looking like this does right now where we've just content, 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 right? How do you reveal that content? How do you get your user moving through it? Um, a lot of that is design decision. Um, so simple little things in these vertical scrolling courses go a really long way. Going in and doing something as, as simple as just adding you know, a content background behind you know your individual sections of your course uh and using just a, a shape with a light tone you know maybe your top your background of your course is white and then your your content block you know background that you've added in here is you know 10 percent gray right like just very minimal difference between background color but creating that distinction between sections on the page goes a really long way to kind of increasing the 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 you know or the the design experience, right? Mm -hmm. So if I look at this, right, uh, again, uh, not well positioned because I just kind of blindly did it, but, uh, and it's the same color as my background card, but you get the idea. Uh, <laughs> creating yeah. kind of a distinct areas on the page becomes pretty important when you're doing these types of things, right? Um, and and is, is really what can make or break the difference between a really nice looking course that kind of carries this style forward and does things well or just a clunky long page that has a bunch of stuff tacked on it yeah for reason right right and i think you know uh there's a comment in the chat from george and in george i i agree with you i think i think we're almost there though from what uh from what bill is showing us here with the different wireframes where you can kind of build them separate and then yeah, you could already have each of these things built separately, fully functioning, and then do your um, your copy and move over. But yeah, we agree. You know, stacking right there does it does create a little bit of a uh, not even a headache, but just a, a nice to have for sure. So it's a, a good point. Make sure to take it back to the development team because that seems like uh, yeah, that's a that's something that both Bill and I agree with. So no, great comment. Now, um, so another thing that I tend to like to do with this type of stuff is just a, a quick, quick little tip, right? So, you know, back to thinking about this example where we had uh, this progressively revealing content as we go. Well, that is just a matter of how you play with visibility and on, you know, and show actions really is, is all it is. But it, it goes in, I mean, it's huge impact in these types of courses, okay? So, the way that I would do something like that, right? Um, you know, I've got this BG card thing here. I've got these carousel bits. If I wanted it so that, you know, this interaction wasn't there until I either complete, well, until I scrolled down the page some. Um, mm -hmm. I would basically go about that. I'm not, I'm not gonna go through the entire thing. You know, I'm just gonna talk through part of it and then I'm gonna show you one little interaction. I basically just go through the process of adding a couple actions to a couple different objects and initially hiding the things that I wanted to, to initially hide, just like you normally do in like, or it's just standard development stuff, right? So like in this particular case, I've got the, this button, this background, right? I would just go over here and I would set them to be initially hidden. Uh, same thing, with this content, I'm gonna set that to be initially hidden. So that when I, when I view my page, right? Uh, scroll down and yeah, there's nothing there. But what I want to have happen is that when I scroll past this button, I want this to pop up, to show up, mm -hmm. right? What I do then is I just need to go in on my buttons or, or any trigger uh, or any object rather, not trigger, and add an action to it in, in Lectora. Um, that's basically, I go in here and I say action, add action, you know, on, if you go down here, the actual trigger, is, we have a scroll into view and a scroll out of view trigger. They do is exactly what it sounds like. So in this yeah. particular case, when I scroll that button up and off the screen, so out of view, all right, scroll out of view, I want to just go in and do the stuff that I normally do in an interaction. I want to show 
Uh, and then I want to pick my object, right? And so in that particular case, I think it's like card background is my main object. Yeah, so BG card. Okay. And then, you know, you could just do that for all your objects in that same spot. Or fun tip stuff. What I tend to like to do, I tend to like to have the target object. Uh, I, tend, I tend to like to have the, the action to show the initial object on, on scroll be on one object. And then all my subsequent actions to show my other objects be tied to the actual object I initially show, right? So instead of putting on my on scroll out, show, you know, five other things on this one, this one button, I'm just gonna put that on the BG card. And on BG card here, I'm gonna add some additional actions that would be like, you know, uh, uh, on show, show these things, right? Um, depending on, how my objects set up. That's just like that's a, how you get that nice kind of easy in transition. It's that no, way. no, it's not that. That's more for development uh, kind of ease of use, right? So okay. one of the challenges that I find is that like um, when I'm going through here, I know like these are my objects that I'm really dealing with their visibility, okay? But mm -hmm. I've got all of their actions tied to an object way up here right on the page when you're dealing with these vertical things. So I, I, I tend to like to just limit that down to one action on this object that's going to be hard to find. And then, <laughs> and then add all my, my ob objects, you know, more closely tied to what I'm actually trying to affect. That's just a personal preference. This is like a tip thing for you. Another one of those, by the way, um, I had referenced that the themes, right? They've got that kind of anchor to bottom thing going on. And you can see here, I've got this, what is this object? Well, what this is, this is something that we put in off screen that works on lower device views for uh, most likely the, yeah, it's that four tab click to reveal, right? Um, but it's way down at the bottom of the page already. That, that's because it's offset from bottom, right? It's setting is tied to that. So that we do that because then when we're de designing for mobile portrait, um, that commonly extends down the page quite a lot, right? So in a standard slide authoring and you know, situation you, you want to have that checked off so that when you move over to portrait and move things around, this thing will all automatically move for you. But in this environment, that can be a little tricky. So so some of the templates that we have in the library, just letting you know, and we're, we're working for how to address this going forward as well to, to make some stuff that's really catered toward this. Um, certain, certain library templates are difficult with this type of thing, okay? So like these expert opinions, um, when you, you download these, you know, these, these character based things that are down at the bottom, they're anchored to the bottom, they're offset from bottom so that we can get a nice alignment in the other device views. But when you put them in this type of a file, often those characters are going to move down the page on the long page. So one real fun tip with that, okay, that actually works quite well is when you do your initial download, you do your AWO, um, before you drag the interaction file, you know, into your long page is go in and, and kind of double check and then turn some of these off, right? So like offset from bottom on all four of these. If I go in and I turn those off now, when I drag those characters uh, and I'm just going to drag those to kind of save some bandwidth here, uh, or some speed. When I, uh, when I drag those characters into my interaction, now they, they're not going to be, they're not going to be anchored to the bottom like they were previously. They would have shot straight down, but now they're going to be tied more closely to the top, which is where you're going to expect to find them. Uh, and you can grab them and drag them down. So uh, just as kind of a workflow thing, right? If you're using template library asset or library asset library templates, there it is. Right. Uh, <laughs> and and you download one, you, you put it into your long scrolling page and you notice, wow, something's moving. Why is this thing moving? Go back to the original template and double check that that offset from bottom isn't checked for slide-based delivery. Um, and if it is, uncheck it. And then bring it back over. Awesome. Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, or, you know, uncheck it from the page one and then move it back where you want it and then don't worry about it, but that's what happened. Uh, it's kind of a heads up. So that's why I tend to, to try to do that up front. I, I'll go check my file before I drag anything over. If I see something funky, say, okay, not funky, but you know, set up that like what we're talking about, right? It's clearly yeah. device views that I'm not using. I don't check that and then move it up and I'm good to go. All right. Um, but, but really, right. Like, so that's it. I, I mean, I know it's not a whole lot of building here necessarily that I'm showing you, but that's because it there from a build standpoint, there just isn't a whole lot to it. 
Yeah. Um, it really is. It's exactly the electoral authoring that you're used to. Um, all the same, you know, action groups, targeting content. I mean, it's all the exact same thing. You're just changing your format. Um, and there's a couple little things to consider. Design is frankly the most important thing. The build is simple enough that anybody can, can do it. Um, the build, the only few things you really need to be aware of are whether or not you need to be, need to be concerned with mobile portrait. Um, B, that you do got to move objects down the page when you move them into the page. That's expected behavior right now. That may or may not change as we go going forward. I, I know we're looking into it at least. Yeah. Um, uh, and, um, you know, then that little funky thing about, you know, the offsetting with templates, right? But other than that, it's a, it's a very straightforward kind of a, a practical thing to do in Lectorum. Yeah. Right. And, you know, and it gives you the freedom to, you're not stuck to a, I would say like once you're in that framework or template, you're not stuck to it. It's not like it has to be here. It has to be here. You can really, you can be the, yeah, you can be the web developer of the course and, and, and affect things that way. So well, no, this is know, great. You say that, right? Uh, and if we've got, I know we only have 14 people, 15, something like that. We've got a low, fairly shallow call today, right? Um, if we've got any developer developer folks out there or, or, you know, especially folks who kind of meet that description and are not uh, super duper familiar with Lectora, um, the Lectora is kind of begging for the, 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 those folks to a certain extent. That's not what it's primarily aimed at, but, but those folks can do an awful lot with this type of a format, right? So keep in mind, um, there's scripting options that are available in Lectora that aren't just aren't or certainly aren't as easily accessible elsewhere. Um, there's also XAPI power in, in Lectora, like the desktop that is not accessible elsewhere. And, you know, so yeah. those things, you know, if, you, if you've got those, that type of skill set and that type of thinking, and then now you got flexibility in your course format, you can see there's a lot of power. There's a whole lot of power to be had there. Um, but it just kind of comes down to creativity or your design, right? Like, um, yeah. Well, and even this gives someone like uh, a learning administrator like myself, uh, I can still utilize the templates and stuff that I need to yep. um, and then just drag and drop them in like I need to. And with a couple of clicks, then then as an, a learning administrator, I don't have to worry about really doing like the uh, what's what would you call it? The coding of the, you know, some people reference it to the coding of the course. I can really express my creativity and, and yeah. focus on that part of it. Absolutely. So Absolutely. Monique, I, Monique, I agree with you. Uh, you know, uh, I said during my first one here, being a customer uh, f of eLearning Brothers for 10 or 12 years. Yeah, the first person, I'll show you something cool. Uh, the first person, when I got into eLearning, going from a, a field role and stuff, the first tool she taught me to make eLearning with was Lectora. This is 10 or 11 years ago, and I still have the uh, the little Buddha she gave me and stuff uh, for just such, you know, that thing of, hey, this, you know, this takes a little bit and stuff. And I'll be honest, yeah, left, I uh, hadn't used Lectora in so long, but then I kept, you know, before I even started working here, I started touching base in it because I started becoming a, I, I set up an RLP instance for a, a former employer, uh, made digital content, really used Bill's templates a, a lot. But I kept thinking, you know, what is the next level of where I can take this to? And, you know, I still had that little hesitancy about getting back into Lectora. But when I did, it's stuff like this where it's, it's as easy as you think it can be. It's just a matter of knowing where it, where it is. You can still, uh, it's, a, it's as simple as just navigating where some things are, but then you can make a, a Jupiter course that, you know, I don't think I can make anywhere of the other tools that I've used before. So it's just, it's a, uh, it is, it can be Monique. Uh, it can be overwhelming. Um, but what it is, is that that initial little burst is just, there are so many possibilities that you just, you just came uh, open to that you weren't open to before. And I think it's uh it's the overwhelming maybe-ness of a plethora of riches or options that you can use. Um, uh, I keep thinking of like other movie quotes that I could get into, like the, the arc that you can look at and stuff. And maybe it's the Ark of the Covenant, Indiana Jones. Uh, 
kind of vision of it where it's it's just so bright and overwhelming and yeah, as long as you're not one of those German Nazis, you're okay. Yeah. It's just yeah, uh Moni, great comment. Um no, that's all I have, guys, and I hope this was I hope this was really beneficial. Does anyone have any other questions for Bill or or myself? And yeah, I mean we've got uh you know we've got some additional time left here. So uh one of the things we tend to do is uh those don't have to be particularly about what we were talking about today. So if you do have uh, kind of a burning lectora question, I'm kind of end of in end of these sessions is really particularly great for those because you get a captive audience. So why not throw it out there? It looks like Bill, we do have a question about if you create one of these awesome scrolling courses, does that impact 508 compliance? Mm -hmm. So. Um, you can certainly build an accessible course that is long and scrolling, right? So if you think about a web page, we got accessible web pages and we have accessible interactive web pages. So a lot of that comes down to how you're handling your design and what types of interactions you put on the page, things like that. To make some of that actually, I don't, I don't know if easier is the right word, but it certainly is easier, but it's, it's not the important part about it. Um, I guess to make that more uh, solid, even, I guess I'd say, I don't know. I don't know. Gonna, I know um, maybe Troy, you can talk about this. We've got a, a set focus action, yeah. right? Well, then, it, it, yeah, right. as you go through it, it kind of acts like a, to me, it flows in a more logical pattern, uh, like reading down the pages and stuff. And even with a screen reader, maybe you're not making as many click you know action button uh things as you are like it's focusing and navigating you through the page right um, so so depending on your design right and depending on how you use some of the act like that right the set focus action we've got in, in the course you can make that to a greater or lesser degree 508 awesome right um, certainly doable, certainly easy to do. Uh, and in fact, you can get something that's probably a pretty darn great reading experience, really, uh, um, um, if I'm not super mistaken. Um, but it just comes down to your design. And build. Get all I, in, Monique, yeah, I think the answer to your question, it doesn't uh, hurt it at all. It's, it's still the same. You're still building the same course. It doesn't uh, hamper it at all. Yeah. All right. Okay, we're light on questions, it looks like. That's fine. Yeah, it looks like, Bill, you just explained everything too well. As always. As yeah. always. Okay. As always. Clearly. Uh, yeah. I did post a link in the chat to the Lectora free trial. So if you're not already a user, you can sign up for a free trial. And that can also get you access to a free trial of the asset library. And I posted the templates to the three different scrolling examples that Bill shared earlier. Yeah. So with the free trial of Lectora and the asset library, you can download those, you can tear them apart, create your own thing, and have all the fun in the world. Yeah, and I think that's that's something I'll, I'd stress just from from sitting where you guys were before. Utilize the templates, utilize those features, and and kind of back your way into learning the more difficult interactions and stuff that are already done for you. But you don't have to feel the stress of learning it on your own. It's already done there. It just it allows it, you know, create stuff that you you had never thought you could before. Absolutely. All right. Well, since there are no more questions, thank you so much, Bill and Troy, for joining us today and showing us all this. And thank you to everyone on the call for joining us today. Hopefully we'll see you at another webinar soon. And keep an eye on your inbox for the recording of today's. Thank you, everyone, and have a great rest of your day. Thanks, guys.